all yours. Thanks so much. Um, thank you for having us. Um, thanks to the Shuffle Collective. Um, I'm super excited to be here with these two magnificent, brilliant beings. Um, so we, we, Bridget, before you got on, we just did like rock, paper, scissors, and, and I had to go first. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, so I guess I'm also introducing us. We, we decided to do sort of a little bit like fly by the seat of our pants and really treat this hour pretty simply. We're just going to read a little bit, um, maybe talk a little bit about where we're at with um, this time, this this time that we're expected to have free time as writers, um, just some conversation that we had <laughs> that we're going to expand upon today. And then, um, and then, yeah, we'll, we're just going to each take a little bit of time each and then and get into conversation with all of you. So hopefully you'll be able to, to chime in through the chat and, and whatnot, and we can dialogue. Um, so uh, my name's Tracy. My pronouns are she and they. And uh, I'm an artist based in Los Angeles. I'm in the South Bay of Los Angeles in Gardena. And uh, I do a lot of work in Little Tokyo in downtown Los Angeles and with our partners around the city. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm mostly just curious about Bridget and Rocio, how you're all doing. And, and I'm curious about, you know, all of you that participated, like, what brought you to this weekend? What brought you to even joining us right here and now? Um, so uh, I'm just gonna share one piece and then talk a little bit about it afterwards. Um, so this is called Notes to Future Healing Self. We are there again, swirling in the cycle that shouts at itself because we stopped listening. Do we move forward in reverse or pause in familiarity? When the clock begins to fall off the wall, when the universe stumbles off balance, when the angels merge and devils go hunting, you will dare to recall this time because in the best of all possible scenarios, you will be living now, then, this moment. When you decided to wake up in spite of the morning the world handed you, to release your feet from the bed, to walk up to your own fences, to take the shears your mistakes have sharpened, cut through the heavy metals of resentment and regret, run beyond your own horizon, and break, leap, fly past your mesosphere, stopping only to heave wretched exhales while leaning up against the moon. Looking back only to mark checks on your list for a typical Friday. Cooking and eating what my body thanks me for later. Taking time to breathe big long breaths more than once a day. Striking at long last the balance between time spent available to other and available to self. Letting your community engage with your care. Ask again. Keeping promises to self. There is no going back. We are a continuum of gratitude. We are a continuum, and I am grateful. Dearest future healing, please note, this is merely a period that presents itself as reminder that this body is this world, is this body, and we are always in a state of crisis. That crisis is a closing window we will jump through and shut behind us or keep open to let our remembrances circulate. That our memories are cries for what our next poems will heal. That this body is a vessel for what our future whispers. You are here now to thank all things. You are alive, self nudging your best self. So remember, love, your diagnosis, summer, 2016. So, uh, thank you. We, uh, I decided to, to share this. Um, I've been working on the, the sort of closing notes for my forthcoming book. Um, doing a lot of like notes to future self, notes to future community, notes to future us, notes to future world. 
Um, but I also wanted to do a version of uh, a note to my future self that it's healing um, and do it from the kind of standpoint from my diagnosis of cancer back in the summer of 2016. And I wanted to read this today because I think I, I think I'm thinking a lot about when I'm thinking about crisis or like moments of crisis, I do think that I find these connections and these parallels on a personal basis to between now and to something as severe as like a diagnosis of cancer. And because I think there are times where everything seems so profound, everything seems so like egregious um, when in fact, maybe there are things that we just haven't been paying attention to, or I haven't been paying attention to in my own self, in my own body, or in this world, in this world. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I wanted to put this out as an offering to maybe think about the conversations we're going to have with ourselves in a year from now. And what are the things that we're going to maintain, like the good things that we're going to maintain from now. Um, and I also think I want to do a version of this in terms of not just to self, but kind of like Dear's future healing world um, and how that might shift a little bit. Um, and it be a piece more um, about reckoning. Um, does that make sense? You know what I mean? Because <laughs> Because we have a lot to reckon with in terms of just facing, I think, the reality of what this world already is and what it has been. And we're just seeing the, the, all the worst of the worst things are surfacing on the news, right, and in the mainstream. But stuff that we know that our families and cousins and, and communities have been facing for like eons and forever. So, so, yeah, it's also kind of a precious time. It's like this window, right? So. Those are my thoughts. That's where I am. That's what I wanted to share for this second. So I think Rocio's next, yeah? Uh, excuse me while I like have a vulnerable moment. One of the things about seeing your colleagues when you go read to them, like you're facing them and they're facing out and the lights are bright or they can't see you. So they don't see you like losing your shit. And here I am like hearing my colleagues and I'm so impressed right and it's all true and it's hard to hear your truth so yeah and I remember that and you know that what I'm going to read it has a lot of survivor's remorse about it and when I think of survivor's remorse I think a lot about privilege right like who lives and who doesn't and who tells the tale and things like that and, and I've always been the type of person who reacts very strong in a crisis like it's time to do these things in this moment but afterward I lose my shit I'm like oh my god that could have gone this whole other way right so and I even reading that hearing you read that Tracy I'm just like that could have gone a whole other way and I'm so happy you're in the world So that's Thanks. real for me <laughs> because I love you and love you, sis. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this, the whole thing about the world being on fire is that like we're angry and we're sad and somehow we got out of bed, but there's, and I want to ask both of you this for later, like, you know, people, it feels like we're always scrounging for regard as artists, like, Oh, we're necessary. We're necessary. Every time the world is about to end, the people who like to, you know, prepare by stockpiling weapons and making sure that like the the riffraff don't come for their private property, right? Being prepared, they play social Darwinism. Who's valuable? Who's essential to society, right? And you know, the people that they respected the least are usually the most essential, as we're seeing now. And you know, some some of us who are artists, like we also have some of these jobs where we have to be continue to be in contact with people. You know, some of our, our most celebrated poets are working at grocery stores right now. They're doing childcare right now. They're doing, you know, they still have to go into and face the world or take care of elders and buy things for them and things like that. And, and I wonder about um, just exposure and 
who has the luxury of, of sitting out whatever and I struggle sometimes as an artist I'm like I'm in a lot of pain and I don't want to take up space but it's, it's like this is real and like I don't I don't want to talk I just don't want to read anything I just want to say Amaud's name like for an hour for a fucking hour um and it's one of a family of troubles right that we're conscious of and facing um yeah so I'll read some stuff I'm working on. Um, yeah, but not this is not without its its um, two brains, right? Like it's time to face things, and then this just like I I have an image of like a yarn drawer, like you open it and all the yarn comes out, and like it's like spaghetti all tangled up, and like trying to untangle it is going to be like. So you just burn it all down. <laughs> but I'll read some stuff because that's what I signed up to do, right? That's sometimes what we do. Alrighty. So this is from um, a newer book that I'm writing. What I wanted to tell you, you found out before I did. Everybody gets a dead friend eventually. Being born first is supposed to mean, I'll look, so you don't have to, except that time you had to. We are losing our eyesight together, little sister. I will say that it was wrong to be too good at just facing things, bruising your legs as I lifted you out of the crib and put you in the stroller to go look for our mother. You were so small, and I was already a bad person. I realized... I could kill someone if they meant you ill when I was seven years old. I should have stopped trying to be good then, for it has brought the both of us nothing but sorrow. I said to the interviewer that I do not have religious guilt, and I don't. I have fields of unturned soil and cuts from the cotton and cold in my bones and the coyote's song, and not no shoes, but broken shoes, and translation, and translation, and translation. And if I hear one more person saying, it isn't right to let little children know adult troubles, then God help me build that time machine, and you translate those amnesty documents, not me, and you recite the Pledge of Allegiance, not me, and you learn to read by counting wars in my language and not me. I needed to live, understand? I was sent into the forest and I needed to know the wolf's name and say, I too come from wolves. And then this uh, piece called Nawali from an old little chapbook of mine, but it, it kind of goes with this like, you know, you go speak for our family. You, little Riding Hood, go into the forest and face the dangers and do the task. Nawali, or how I met my mother. Except that fascia lies as mezzanine between fur and flesh. And marrow is why bones are hollow, broken as clay flutes. Except that blood of my blood, you came singing that music high and sharp. I built your cradle from sinew, from dry brush, except that the yaki and the scorpion are your people. The hunter's knife here to free you, caperucita. You ready the grave and let me know when you're through. Ah, so I yield the floor to my beloved colleague, and sister in arms, Bridget Bianca, and I want to hear your wonderful work from your new book, Be Trouble, and and then let's talk some. You're mute. Oh, oh my goodness! I've been talking this whole time just on mute so that I wouldn't bother y'all. So I've been like, yes, what? Making faces. Um, thank you to everyone for being a part of this, and thank you for this this day, this conversation. I think we've all been asked this question of, you know, what is the role of the poet right now? What are poets doing right now? Are you writing? Are you creating? You know, are you doing the thing 
that's going to let me feel what I feel out loud, right? Are you doing that work for me? Uh, to, and I think it's been quite difficult, honestly, because as a poet myself, I thrive on anger. And I think folks who know me know that, right? Um, and there is so much anger now, but there's also so much sadness and it's tough to uh, tease the two apart uh, when it comes to writing right now. So I haven't written anything. I've been fixated on images and ideas, but I just cannot manage to write. I could barely like write my name uh, to, to anything, right? But besides writing a poem. So um, I'm gonna share a couple pieces and then we're going to get into this discussion. I look forward to hearing questions from folks in the chat and also bugging you guys too, because I was taking notes while you were reading because that's the kind of person I am. Also my memory shit, but that's a whole different conversation. Okay. Um, I'm going to read the, the first, actually the first two poems, I think from the book, we're going to, let's see. The first poem is called, At Least I Can Say. I have never wanted to kill myself but I've always been keenly aware that I could die any day. I've always been sure something was trying to kill me. The scenarios vary. In almost all of them, I am afraid. In some of them, I am fighting. In all of them, I lose, but I never give up. So maybe I win after all. This is a strange conversation to have with strangers. But I've always thought eulogies were for people who never knew you well. They say Malcolm knew his journey was ending. Martin knew he wasn't long for this world. I, no, I don't think myself a martyr. I am merely a black woman, which means the same where I come from. That translation is not my fault. It just is. And if it's not death, then what is it? And the second poem that comes right after is called Lesson Number One. Lesson number one says, step outside of your experience. And again, someone shakes head, but me shakes, but me shakes, but me shakes, but me says again, firmly this time, gently this time, emphasizes each word, mimes with hands, step outside of your experience. Lift leg, a sad excuse for a fly girl, kick steps, into another spot for the visually inclined. Watch my body, watch my mouth, form this concept. Step out of your experience. This is you, takes out frying pan. This is your brain on selfish, bashes you over the head. This is you, opens Jet Magazine, July 24th, 1964. This is your heart on compassion, flips to a picture on page eight, this is you, pulls up a social media app, this is your world splintering, plays audio of a four-year-old, mommy, I don't want you to get shooted, mommy, don't cuss. And the last one that I'll do is who will be next? And who will be next? We keep planting these black bodies over and over again, hoping they'll bring us fruit one day. But all I see are rows and rows of smoke. All I smell is tear gas, someone telling us to move on, to push our worries back into the earth. But what are we to do with these bones? We till this soil for the new season, forgetting last year's attempts. And there, these black bodies gleaming white in the sun. These bones just won't stay down. Thank you. So um, I wanted to share those poems because this entire pandemic, um, there's so many things to worry about, right? Beyond like your very, your individual life, like that communal life about everyone. And one thing that um, morosely gave me solace in the beginning, I will say in the beginning was that, well, if we're all staying inside and everyone has kind of agreed to leave each other alone, right? Then we won't hear about like the, the, the violence that we normally hear about school shootings, you know, uh, uh, hate crimes, police shootings. And then I was absolutely incorrect, right? Um, so that violence did not remove the body. It was not divorced from the body. And the uh, policing of self and the policing of our communities in a, in a very uh, social way has not stopped. And so even that one kind of shining glimmer of light that I would not have to mourn folks for things other than COVID-19, right? 
it disappeared completely, right? That just it dissipated uh, immediately. And I find it difficult during this time of mourning to divorce the two, right? Like I thought that I could see the death happening during the coronavirus as in some ways rational, right? That you are sick and so your body needs to either heal or continue. And that if so, your body cannot survive it. And this is something that could naturally happen to you, but it's not natural at all. It still feels like violence upon the body. Um, I can't divorce the two ideas. I, I do see this as a, as a grotesque experiment happening to the global public, right? So um, those two poems just kind of fit my feeling of these deaths are happening and, and what are we kind of doing? Really nothing, honestly, right? Um, and then we turn around and say, so poets, what are you doing during the pandemic? It's like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm surviving so I can be here for the next pandemic. I don't know, right? I have no idea. So um, I want to open it up to us to kind of dig in and so what have you been doing? And be honest, because I'm going to be real honest. Um, so I find a lot of comfort in my routines. Like mm -hmm. I get up uh, sometime between seven and nine. And like the thing is when you have small animals or children, like they don't, you, you don't get to choose your schedule. And my cats run me. So, <laughs> so they demand my attention. And I, I get up and I, you know, give them attention and they they take me outside. And then I'm very lucky to rent a small house on a huge lot. And I just like stare at the plants. And that's one thing that being from like rural heritage, I understand that's like, it's okay when there's time to labor, there's a lot of labor, but sometimes you just have to like sit in the orange grove and stare at the cicadas. You know what I mean? And just be in their hum. And I think that I just replicate that. I was taught it by my parents as like, it was just part of their lives. They didn't teach it as a self-care strategy or anything. It was just like, sometimes you just have to like watch the ants climb the coffee plant. And then, you know, when it's time to work, it's time to work. But sometimes this is what you do. So I, I have gone out into my yard and I, I advise people if there's, if, if, you have a, a green thumb in you. Like I have taken over little sidewalk plots when I've lived in apartments with no yard and stuff like that. If you have any that, if you know someone, encourage them to make a green space because, you know, it 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 makes a difference to me. I feel like at a biological level to just like be around plants. So I just go and I be with my plants. And I only just started writing things down this week. I get you, Bridget. I'm just like, and and I've also felt with a failure. Like I'm supposed to be producing. And I don't know if it's like this, you know, capitalism got us fucked up that we got to be productive all the time, you know, but but I, I felt like I'm an artist failing. Like, this is my moment to record this for the posterity, you know, like everybody's reading Camus, right? The Plague, La Peste, or mm -hmm. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Love in the Time of Cholera, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's like reading those. Two, and I'm like, but so I suck at this clearly. You know, or also I'm a person and I'm whatever it may. And again, this whole thing is like, I'm getting through real good. I'm like doing what I have to do. And then later I'm going to be like in the worst funk for a year and a half. <laughs> I'll write about it after we lived, mm. after we lived and we swept up the ashes and we buried the bodies and we archived the things after we lived. That's when things might happen when I'm just like, Oh my God. Have you ever been in like in a near car accident? I've been in car accidents, but like, have you ever been in a near car accident and be like, Oh my God, that almost happened to me. Yeah. And after you get like all shaky and shit, like there's a different kind of shakiness after almost getting something happen to you. Right. Okay. So I feel like after like enough time has passed, I'll be like, <gasps> like worse than now. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Uh, what are you thinking, Tracy? Oh my gosh, so many things. I know I'm supposed <laughs> to look at my camera, but you know, Bridget's here and Rosita's here, so I'm gonna be looking this way because I'm gonna Same, look at I'm looking you guys too. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's taken me a really long time to find some balance, and I think the 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 words that have have emerged for me this week 
um, which are kind of the words that save me always are forgiveness and gratitude. Um, because those first two weeks, I'm, I'm the primary caretaker for my mom and my partner Joyce is the primary caretaker for her mom. They live in two different places, you know, Orange County and, and South Bay. And uh, I think by the, by the third week, I was already doing that thing of like, oh, how come I don't have a routine by now? Mm -hmm. I was hearing about all these routines and people were already doing classes. And I was like, wow, you know, I was, I was finding myself just like beating myself up and already going into this weird zone of like, you should be, you know, finishing your artwork for the book. You should have it decided who's going to, you should be doing all this business. And, you know, and I was like, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute we are all working off of this like elevated level of anxiety on a minute and minute to minute and daily and weekly basis that we don't even realize. Cause now we're like normalizing it and we're sort of like, this is kind of, we keep seeing the new normal, but it's just, I think it's like this elevated, like the bar has been raised on like our anxiety level and we're sitting on top of that. And so I think what became pronounced to me was I just need to focus on like what feels right, like right now and for the next 90 minutes for my body. And I can't really, you know what I mean? Like as much as I, I plan and I schedule, I, I also know when it comes down to the day, it's like, what can I do for the next hour? <laughs> you know? And I think when it comes to gratitude, um, that's where to me community comes in really big. And uh, the, the community in Little Tokyo is very tight. And there's been a lot of focus on, on mutual aid efforts that have been really about like community, feeding community. That's like literally the name of a program that um, Little Tokyo Community Council is doing. And, um, and I think that, you know, some of the stuff that I've been engaged in, just keeping our eyes on the prize of like folks who are uh, detained and how we can offer some pieces of humanity. And, and if I'm doing any writing, really it's letters. I'm writing letters, mm -hmm. really simple, short letters, just so I can write as many as I can um, to sort of offer a piece of myself and like be engaged with folks who are coming out of detention centers, literally to open air and nothing, not even a mask. Um, so, you know, and then like, I think personally, like, um, the, I, the, some of the, the stuff that I think keeps me sane, like I'm eating like one week, Joyce and I roasted like a huge, huge bowl full of garlic. And I was like, I'm going to eat as much garlic, <laughs> as much raw onions. Like I, I, I don't shower as much, you know? <laughs> My hair, I'm Marge Simpson at this point, right. you know, like I'm going to fucking do whatever I'm going to do. And, you know, and, and what are the things that are going to like feed me the best? And I was like, wow, a lot of the stuff I want to do it, it, it like, it's, it's good for me to be at home, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, yeah. and, and that's the thing that I really talked a lot about with Joyce. She is an attorney at a small law firm in Whittier and has been working from home and, that's been like the, the coolest part, I think, for us just as a pair, you know, to spend this kind of time together um, and realize that we don't totally make each other crazy by doing mm -hmm. that. And um, and I'm I'm mostly worried about her when this like goes transitions to her being back there Monday through Friday. Um, it's already like a stressful job for her. And I think I think that there's going to be a whole when you talk about like the depression after, like, I think there's going to be a whole set of transformation that either has to happen in companies that have workers Monday through Friday or, or, or people, if they don't shift with kind of this difference in awareness of what we can actually do and be more productive with at home. Um, I, I think, I don't know. I just think we're going to, again, we have this opportunity. Do we, do we like see it and go, okay, actually we could maintain better sanity in certain mm -hmm. ways. If we like allow people to uh, get a better wage, <laughs> if we like call people on 
and really, you know, don't support large corporations, right? And 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 laud the folks who are like turning back their loans when they know that they don't need it, right? How are we maintaining the sanity of our workers who, you know, they're they're getting their projects done and they're not even here in this office. You know, like I just so I don't know. I'm I'm really curious about the transition back. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tracy, what you said just remind, just made me think of like, when we think of the Great Depression, we, we mostly, and maybe it's the way we were educated, we think of in terms of economy, like the economy was depressed. But like, it makes me wonder if like, like after that was, that, that happened, if people were just still like, oh my God, those last few years, oh my God. And then they get into this huge funk. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like nobody talks about the emotional aftermath of like having live through scarcity or precarity or whatever. And, and I, I, we have a couple of questions, but I, I first have a question for both of you. And one of the things that's helped me sort of like, I'm not going to say cope because I'm, we're all barely holding it together. Right. right. But like um, sort of contextualize, or if there's like a number line in the universe, like where this thing is shelved, did any of you get stories growing up, you know, maybe, from the war, from the this, from the that, from the those olden times or that terrible thing to help you be like, well, this is what happened then and this is da, 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 da. Like I, I remember having like, you know, obviously when you have a family that does subsistence farming and then also cash crop farming, there's a lot of precarity when it comes to like, uh, for example, my father's family and my mom's family now grow cash crops, wheat and cotton. Wheat is actually a subsistence crop sort of like you could eat it if nobody will buy it you know, but cotton isn't. So you're totally dependent on the market. And guess who's their market? The US. If the US fixes their price a certain way, my relatives are screwed. They're like basically tenant farmers. They're like, they owe the bank for fertilizer, for seed, for whatever. And the next harvest they hope comes in just to pay off the last year's debt, right? So they're Mm -hmm. always on the hook for something. So that, you know, the, the bust and boom, like, oh my gosh, it's harvest time. We have money for school clothes. And then like nothing for a long time, right? Or the way my father worked as sort of like a day laborer at like truck um, at the warehouses where you unload trucks, kind of like those folks at like the warehouse um, hardware stores. Um, Mm -hmm. And when he wasn't working manual labor for like a union. Um, So like I had this idea of like, well, sometimes there's stuff and sometimes there isn't. Right. And then like they would tell me stories of like there was this huge typhoid outbreak in my dad's parents' hometown in Huitzila, Zacatecas. Right. Mm -hmm. And like just like you know, I'm sure that there's hyperbole, but like my dad was be like, the streets were running with blood for real, for real. It was like, when you think of the bubonic plague, bring out your dead. They're not always dead all the way, but they're going to be dead. Like, so they would tell me these stories. So I was like, in my mind as an adult, as a 44 year old person, like put, piecing together, like, okay, I have this story. I have this, I learned this in school and this happened to my people and that are like trying to like, find a way to normal as a verb. I want a normal, mm-hmm. right? And just like having those stories to go back on, on times of lack and times of scarcity. Did I mean, what are, what are, are you doing that? Like just a way to like person and. I think for me, so when I think about like my family in particular coming from Louisiana, both sides, small town, I don't have many stories from my family about, oh, this is how difficult times were. There's a there's a, like this assumption of times were difficult. Like this is it. We are black people. We live in this state, in this town. We do this kind of work, and this is what life is like. And it isn't as if life is any better or worse for my neighbor or any better or worse for the guy down the street. This is how life is. This is how we make it through life, and then we get to this next step. And I think that is something about like just talking about the history of poor persons, the history of a people of color in the U.S. Right where it gets to be like, well, this is how life is. You, this is how life is. You grow up in this area. This is your, fa- your father does this, your mother does this, your grandparents did that. And you don't get a chance to actually stop and consider they were going through the Great Depression or going through some type of economic swing or shift, like socioeconomic swing or shift. It's just like, this is what life was. You know, I, I heard a talk once where a person was like, well, if you were a per- poor person before the Great Depression, you were a poor person in the Great Depression, and then you were a poor person after the Great Depression, there really was no depression right? If you were living week to week, paycheck to paycheck, if you are barely eating, you know, still hungry uh, before, you're going to be hungry during and hungry after, right? And I think um, when I hear like American history talks about like, oh, you know, we survived. It was difficult. We made it. It's like, well, yeah, 
well, who is we? You know, like that kind of question. And it's, that's a whole different com- different deal. But the idea of during this time period, the people who are suffering the most, the people that I look to in my family, my friends who are losing their jobs, losing their their pieces, all I could give them is hope and that they have been resilient in the past. That resilience is just what you've been this whole time. You've been doing this this whole time. My best friend and I were talking about how our lives pre-Rona and post and during Rona are pretty much the same. I don't go anywhere because I never went anywhere. I was an introvert the whole time. I just can't go to Target. Like, that's my only big deal. But when I think about people outside of myself, right, that step outside of your experience, I look at their experience and I say, I, I, I don't know what to say to you, right? I don't know what to say to farm workers who are being ignored, right, as essential workers and as workers, period. The very people that uh, uh, we have factions that fight to remove from the nation are keeping the nation, you know, eating right? But they are also possibly also going hungry. That was already the case before the coronavirus, right? And so who will mourn that experience? It, who will be left to mourn it, right? And who will think to mourn it? And so I've been just thinking about, like I said, as an artist, if I don't document or consider or make what's happening to people that I know uh, important in my writing, then will they be remembered at all? Uh, when we look back at history, will people think about these workers? People think about folks who are coming out of the prison system right now with no idea of what's happening on the outside. I think people think about folks in halfway houses, right? Who will think about what happens to the homeless, right? No matter what corner of the earth they're in or students who are barely housing secure if they lose their dormitory, who will write about them in the end? Nobody will if we don't do it. Um, But it's a lot to weigh on you, right? Like if I don't do it, then it's not going to be counted, but I can barely like feed myself in the morning because I'm so sleepy, right? Like how do I become the person who has to document these things? So yeah, that's, I'm thinking about how I'm going to have to tell those stories and do a better job than the folks told me those stories, I guess you could say. Mm. That's overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The world is on fire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we're just poets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, 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 gosh, I mean, whew. I think that's why I'm holding on to this like idea of like, what's like the little thing I can do today What's like the little thing I can write, even if it's like a word, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I, I think things, you know, again, like things have always been this bad and maybe I have just a little bit more room or time to consider some of the areas, like regions in my community, uh, people that, that I could maybe support a little bit more. What, what I mean by that is like, I know that there's a jail in San Pedro, but it, it kind of took this to, you know, remind me of like, out of like 1100 folks that are housed there, um, over half have gotten COVID, you know, Otay Mesa detention center in San Diego has, I think one of the largest outbreaks. Um, and we all know like people are not caring about getting medical care into those facilities. Right. And people are not considering social distancing you know, obviously not. If you're letting half of your population, and I, I haven't even checked the numbers since last week. It's probably it's probably more than that now. And so I think it, it this this whole scenario it is actually meant to overwhelm us even more, right? Like I don't I don't know how much credence I give to like oh these times bring out like the best in people. Oh these times mm-hmm. bring out the worst in people. I think. It's just that when something is very extreme, it's this moment where you see people. You just really see yourself. You really see people. It's not necessarily you're any better. (laughs) You're just like, well, what's, what's driving you to wake up today? Okay, let me honor that. And who do I have around me that I can just like reach out to via text or Zoom for a second and just be like, okay, you have that pocket. I got this pocket. We got this area. You know what I mean? And, and, and whatever we need to do, feed ourselves, get high, sleep in, fucking eat all the garlic you want, you know, like whatever it is we need to do, you know, 
then then we can just keep moving forward. But I think we have to, I don't know, just keep knowing that it's always been this bad. It's always been yeah. this bad. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, your earlier point, Rocio, about like stories from our elder generations. And I, I, that resonates in that I do wonder with folks that uh, have reached out to me about kind of experiencing um, being called like nasty Asian bitch mm -hmm. and, you know, like followed down the street and like just awful, awful things. What that does to that person's psyche moving forward when they do get to start going out again, how does their psyche shift? Right. Cause I always think about like my uncle and I, I think that the stories that my mom tells me like post-war uncle you know, he grew up speaking Japanese, but you can't really catch him speaking that language anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, so much of himself got extracted, right? That he, I think his psyche completely shifted. So it wasn't like, oh, it was hard for that time. And then they got, they moved on. Mm -hmm. Like on the face of it, it might look like it, but like the psyche underneath, I do wonder about like our collective psyche moving forward. Um yeah, I think that I mean, that's like a, a bigger topic that like it has everybody resonates with it. Like the three of us resonate with it, like how we police each other. And I mean, just like how do you blend in or become invisible or at least not attract the attention of violence? Right? Mm -hmm. and, like, how do you mute yourself? And like, there's just no muting yourself. People are mm -hmm. always going to like, oh, you it doesn't matter how many generations you've been here you're a foreigner, you don't fit into this idea of our like great nation state that was provided by some deity, right? You're in, you're just something to be removed or an obstacle, or it is our birthright to remove you because we are the stewards of this nation state, which was provided by a deity, right? I think, I don't know. I feel like a lot of generations have, you know, maybe, maybe our generations are like, there's nothing you can do. You could follow all the rules you could get all the degrees you could have all the like things and it won't matter in the end on the street people will gun you down minding your own business right at your job like it, people will find like there's it's an it's a, a we can never win that game right um there's something that both of you just mentioned that made me think of I'm making my students think about all this anti-Asian uh, propaganda that's happening right now because I just, I can. And so I'm making them do it just because they need to understand because they're young and they're out there in the world. And I don't want to hear about a hate crime in their neighborhood because you, are, you exist in this world. And so something that we talked about was that people think that, oh, when this is over, people will go back to normal and they will not be hateful anymore. And that is, an, that is untrue. And I think and they're not old enough to know about 9-11, which blows my mind once again, because yo, y'all, we're old. So um, I know, like, and, and take it in, because it hurts me too. So I tell them, I say, you know, during 9-11, we had this really, you know, uh, uh, exacerbated Islamophobia, though we always had Islamophobia. We had this exasperated kind of like this, this boom of Islamophobia, and it did not go away. Right. It didn't matter how many Muslim persons that we uh, put into the public and said, hey, look how wonderful they are. Look how uh, patriotic they are, how American they are. It didn't matter in the end. It, in the end, it didn't matter. We can look at every single marginalized group and see that there was a trial, right, a time, right, where it was heightened, but it was always there under the surface or maybe just right above the surface. And there's no time we're just going to just get over it when it's over. I keep thinking about this over. Can we've all been talking about the over, like when it's over, later. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know. And I'm not morose, y'all. Well, maybe I am a little bit, honestly. But I don't know when the over is going to be. I mean, I'm waiting on it. But I don't know when that's going to come. <laughs> when is the over? Uh, but we do, we do have some questions over here in the chat. And so um, there were two questions that are kind of similar. And they both basically were like, you know, um, how do you write about this time when you're living in it? And then someone else said, um, oh boy, do we as poets have an obligation to focus on hope during this anxious time? And I just want to say really quickly, forgive yourself for not feeling hopeful. Forgive yourself for not being like, I'm productive. Like all the productivity porn on Instagram, like forgive yourself, like it, 
store it away for later when you do have a chance to, you know, um, put together a 2000 piece puzzle, like put that to the side. Uh, but in the meantime, like forgive yourself for just eating garlic or me eating gummy worms. That's my jam right now. <laughs> forgive yourself for not having that for just thinking that watching the ants is enough for today. And literally that's exhausting to me. I'm watching the cards. That's enough for me. Like forgive yourself for that because we don't know when this is gonna be over. You're being productive in the meantime. In the meantime of what, right? I try to start that sourdough fucking shit. Like, no, <laughs> I didn't have yeast. I tried to start it from scratch. <laughs> I, felt like a, I felt like a pandemic. I felt like a failure at quarantine. Like everybody's making bread from scratch. <laughs> And hey, I could use, I could make bread if I have yeast, like the little packet of yeast, but to start my, so I felt like just the same way, like I think that that's, you know, that's a little thing about positivity culture. Everybody's sharing all these cool things that they're doing. Oh, hang on. Sorry, everybody. Jelly pickles moment, <laughs> Zoom pet moment. Hi, bud. If a Zoom, if there isn't a pet. Hey, but wait, wait, I have to say photo, 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 photo. <laughs> Joey, 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 Joey Pickles. He's my little guy. <laughs> Sorry, people in the comments. I hijacked it with my cat. But that's I, what we need, literally. I just well, let me read from Nicole. From Nicole, uh, how would you describe your relationship to silence? Specifically, mm -hmm. your environment devoid of frantic human traffic or when all that language in your head just balks on you. Mm. Environment devoid of frantic human traffic, relationship to silence. Well, my like say my world with silence, it's not. Sorry, go ahead, Bridget. No, same, we're saying the same thing at the same time. Literally my neighborhood, if you could hear the sounds right now, okay, there's no silence. The hood is popping right now. Folks are walking to the store. They're laughing. They're talking. Cars are speeding by. Um, thankfully, I'm not in silence. It's quieter than normal, but most folks would be like, this is loud. For me, I'm like, what's kind of a quiet day? Only four sirens today. That is fairly quiet. Same. Also, get ready. Saturday is Mexican Mother's Day, so there's going to be like drive-by mariachis everywhere in LA. <laughs> I welcome it. Like, you have to drive-by serenade your mother. So... Oh. Yeah, which is one of the things that I have like is when people do drive by like parades, like they just wave signs out of their cars, like little middle schoolers are like, they all get their parents to get in the car. Do you know when you're in middle school, how hard it is to get your parents to do anything that does not involve their family? They're like, who's your friend? I don't, I don't who is this person? And suddenly there's like a parade of cars. So that stuff makes me feel happy. But other stuff about how everybody's like feeling their best and taking advantage of this time for themselves, that makes me feel shitty because I feel like I'm doing that wrong. Right. So. But I will say that, I mean, there's never really silence. If you're if you're a person who's like been in nature or like even in your own little world, your own little backyard, you understand that there's never really silence. There's so many insects. Have you ever just like, like listened? There's like a gazillion insects, right? Even if there's no wind, there's just noise all the time. Like you can hear the soil turning. Do you know what I mean? I think it's what it is. It's not so much a relationship to silence, but it's, it's, we feel that we don't have the same noises that we did before, but some of them are still there. And if you can turn that into a way to feel better, not to make work, you're not obligated to do shit right now, right? Um, I encourage you to think about how people who are, have always been affected by things are affected still or worse. Um, my collaborator and my best friend, Rachel McLeod Kaminer, like she lives on Los Angeles and behind her is Maple and there's Santee and there's like her, her neighbors, people who live outside, they're still there. Mm -hmm. They've never been housed. They've never been removed. They haven't gotten tests. You know, we're all going to praise our mayors and shit after this, but the people are outside neighbors. Look at your outside neighbors. Are they still there? Where do they go? Who put them somewhere right so there's always again it's like it's always been there and is, is it what is it like now um but yeah that's that's my answer about silence the silence of the neighborhood i guess i think about it like in terms of like an internal psyche mm -hmm. whenever i think about relationship to silence i i don't go to sort of the 
physical environment, I always go automatically to like internal, like uh, invisibility and like oppression, cycles of oppression, silence. (laughs) And so that's, my mind just goes there. And it's interesting though, this line specifically, your environment devoid of frantic human traffic. I think the, 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 I'll put forth, I would say, that the the writer's mind, the artist's mind, the creative mind, the human mind, therefore, in general, like, I think we have a lot of fucking traffic. I think we have so much noise inside. And I don't know about any of you, but I have a hard time turning it off. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also find myself, you know, wanting to soak up as much information as I can every day. Um, But I also know there's a time where I have to, like, literally turn it off. And I think that's why the simplest things of, doing stuff that I'm not usually doing, you know, cooking things I don't usually cook, you know, stuff like that. To me, it helps me turn it off. Um, It's probably more of a distraction than a productivity uh, is the way I see it, you know? Um, But I think there's no right way to be doing this. (laughs) You know, (laughs) there's just like, and, and, you know, someone might post a photo one day and the next day, you know, they're like out. They like, they can't deal. So I do I think mean, it's I mean, really it's like it's aspirational. Sometimes our online selves are aspirational, right? Yeah. Like we post that feeling good thing, or we want to remember, right? We're like, oh, I, I I did that thing. That felt good. I'm not going to do it again for like a year, but I, I want to document it. <laughs> right. Well, what is someone else saying? Sorry. Oh, Bridget, go ahead. Um, so it looks like we have just a couple minutes left. Oh. There are so many great questions in this chat. You guys, they're amazing. I have to say this. I'm seeing some really probing things here, but I think we're almost to the end. Do you want to pick one more question just to yeah. send us out? I'm going to take photos of these awesome questions. I know. I'm like, the teacher in me is like, I want to copy and paste all these questions and answer right? them <laughs> for you later. Um, Someone says said something about um, coping, and you mentioned coping too. So maybe we can find that one. Uh oh, there's a comment from. Um, can you each can each of you speak a one line or a word? Like I guess a takeaway. Each in a line, state a word or a line that as an homage to those who suffer most. Just a single emotional image in a word or line. Whoa, whoa, whoa! That is oh. My brain. I don't have a line, but I will say, like, pick a time of day that feels Mm. like you're most you. Right, the evening, the middle of the day, the early morning. Just figure it out what it is, and I'm not going to tell you what to do with it. Just find a time of day that you feel the most you. I'm going to steal a line from Tracy because I was taking notes, and you said a note to my future self that is healing, and I think that's as hopeful as I can get right now is that I'm not necessarily in it right now, but I'm healing soon. And this is a note for when that day comes. I don't know when it's going to be, but it's coming. This is a note just so you don't forget. Yeah. I saw in the comments, somebody wants to give me bread starter. I'm down. (laughs) Can I just take the bread? Can someone just send me a loaf of bread? I have no desire to bake bread. I normally have a, a, a rule where I don't turn on my oven between May and October. I just, I don't have central cooling. What? Oh, okay. I, I get it. I live that. high on the hillside. I'm like, it's fire season. The world is on fire. Uh, <laughs> oh. Can I just, what I'm going to offer one say? word. I'm going to offer the word that I always offer. Gasho. It's like everything that had to happen in the universe for all of us to come together in this moment. Mm. Everything. The shittiest the best, all the things, whatever it took, swirling in our generations, through our bones, into our blood and out of our mouth, like whatever it all took to get us here. So gasho is something I I like to point to. That is beautiful. It sounds like the best way to wrap it up. Can you, (laughs) like that, what can you say? I, hey. We should gas up a van and like hit the road, y'all. Oh my gosh. Roadside side. It might have to be the magic school bus at this point. <laughs> Ms. Frizzle, <laughs> where are you? 
Thank, so, uh, you. And we'll see Thank you to the Shuffle Collective. Thank you both. I love you both. And I'm happy to, spare, you. to like share any kind of virtual or physical space with y'all. Yes. Yes. Always.